coming up on Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. You see, in American Western culture, we have, we have equated, hear me, we have equated numbers, the great swelling of numbers, we have equated that with life, not so. If it's a big church, it must be alive, not so. If it is a small church, it must be dead, not so. What we have to do is go back to the measurement that God uses, and God's ways are not our ways. This is Bible Time. Welcome to Bible Time. We're back in Revelation chapter 3. We only got started last week to the church at Sardis. I call this the church that didn't live up to its potential, and you'll understand why as I go through the text. We have been identifying what the church is, and we've been identifying exactly who Jesus is as he presents himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now the seven stars is a reference back to chapter 1 where he says that he has the seven stars in his right hand. When you look back to chapter 1, you can just turn back one page and see he says... He had in his right hand, that is, John is looking at this great image that is before him, and he said he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. He had seven stars in his right hand. Now remember, the book of Revelation is prophetic literature. That is, it speaks in signs and symbols. And so everything has a, a meaning. Many times only the meaning is just the literal uh, sense of the word. But sometimes it is uh, mystical. It is a sign. It's a simeon. It's a miracle. It is having to do with something that he's going to explain later. Well, if you will look at verse 20 of chapter 1, you will see he explains these seven golden lampstands, the seven stars, everything. And he says, the mystery, that's the Greek word musterion. In the last uh, Bible time I talked with you about um, uh, Mashiach, Messiah, and Christos, that those were Hebrew and Greek words. Well, the word mystery is also a Greek word. It is the Greek word musterion, musteria. And the U in Greek is always changed to the Y when it's brought over into the English language. And so must becomes mist. That's why we say mystery instead of mystery. The mysterion of the seven stars, that is the mystery of the seven stars, something that was hidden is now made plain, which you saw in my right hand, Jesus is saying. The seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, which is the word angelos, another Greek word. When you say angel, you're speaking Greek. The meaning of the word is messenger, messenger. And so sometimes it is a heavenly messenger. That's what it most of the time is in the Bible. But here it is an earthly messenger. The seven stars are the messengers to the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which he saw, are the seven churches. And so who is the messenger of the churches in Asia Minor? Well, I do not think he's talking about the couriers. I don't think he's talking about the people who took the literal letters to the churches. I believe he's talking about the same thing that we talk about when we talk about the messenger. Who is the one that brings the message to the people of God every week? It is the pastor. It is the one who stands accountable. We have a plurality of elders here. There are many elders in the Bible, but the buck stops somewhere with responsibility. 
the delegated authority of the other uh, elders, yes, they stand accountable for that. But when a man stands and proclaims the Word of God, please hear me. I am speaking to an audience here on, in this service in Kingsport, Tennessee. I am speaking to those of you who are listening by YouTube, by uh, TV, by radio. Hear me. When I speak to you, I am more aware of the presence of God than I am of you. And the reason is, you will only judge me and your judgment will count something. Yes, I want you to hear it. But what I really understand is, and the weight falls upon my shoulders is, one day I will give an account that I have rightly explained and rightly divided the Word of God before the Lord in heaven. And I want to hear Him say, I'd love to hear you say, but it is secondary to me, and it is uh, totally irrelevant to me whether you enjoy what I'm preaching. What I need to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant from the Lord Himself. And so he is the one that has me in his right hand. Not only is that great responsibility, but it is great comfort and encouragement to me. Because what that means is what I am assigned to do is to preach the everlasting truth of God. And God will protect me. God will care for me. God will strengthen me. And he will make sure that the fruit that is born will remain. It's my responsibility to be faithful. It's not my responsibility to, quote, be successful because success in the Bible is being faithful. It is God who brings about eternal fruit. And so this is how he identifies himself. Now, here's what he says to the church. Fascinating. He says, I know your works. Let me parenthetically remind us, he says this about every church. I know your works. God sees everything we do. He sees it from the end, from the beginning, the beginning from the end. And not only does he see what we do, he sees why we do. He sees the motivation behind it. And this is according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 10 and 11. This is what we will be judged upon. Not how many works we did, but what sort it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. That is, it will depend upon us as to whether we have the proper motive or not. But God knows our hearts. And He's looking at what kind it is. This is why in 1 Corinthians 3 He talks about that... Paul said, as a master builder, the word is architectos, as a master architect, I have laid a foundation. And there's no other foundation that can be laid except Christ Jesus. But he said, every man, every man, every man builds upon the same foundation as a believer. And that is the foundation of Jesus. And sometimes we build wood, hay, stubble. Sometimes we build uh, gold, silver, precious stones. And the fire of the eyes of the Son of God, according to Revelation chapter 1, will burn through every ill motive and find out why we did what we did. God knows. He says, I know your works. I know what you've done, and I know why you've done it. And he loves the why. He loves the quality. Quantity is good. Quality is better. Because quantity that is wood, hay, and stubble will one day be burned up. The only thing that remains is that which is purified by fire, not destroyed and purged by fire. And so he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, and you are dead. What? What? Do you mean a church can have a name that it's alive and, and everybody say, oh, that's a great church, and it be dead? Well, evidently so. Sardis did. It had a name that it was alive. Its name was not alive. It had a name, a reputation that it was alive. 
You see, in American Western culture, we have, we have equated, hear me, we have equated numbers and the, the great swelling of numbers, we have equated that with life, not so. If it's a big church, it must be alive, not so. If it is a small church, it must be dead, not so. What we have to do is go back to the measurement that God uses. And God's ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are His ways above ours. And the scripture says, you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Now this is the final word. They're dead. As I have preached from coast to coast in America, north and south of the Mason-Dixon line, I have been in churches that before I went there, the, I, I knew they had a reputation as a name that they were alive. I went there and they, they were not alive. What, what, we, what we mistake for life is organization, systems, programs, appeal, conventions. We, we equate numbers with life. We equate promotion with life. The first time I flew into the New Orleans airport, they had a display. As you, I know now, you know, that these are kiosks and displays that they have in airports. But growing up as I did, I didn't know what a kiosk was, that's for sure. And I did not know what all of these displays were for. But there was a, a manufacturing company that had a Beautiful, beautiful display. I was fascinated. People were gathering around this display. It was all encased in glass. And it was long. It was probably 10 feet long. It was probably 6 to 8 feet tall. It was probably 4 feet wide. And, and it had chains and sprockets and pulleys. And they were all just working. And I'm telling you, it's a well-oiled sprot sprockets and pulleys and, and chains and they were well oiled and they were brass and silver and I mean I was just <laughs> it was fascinating to me and a guy looked at me and said what does it do I said you know I don't think it's accomplishing a thing he said, this is just here to get your attention. It's an advertisement for this company. And I thought, man, they got my attention. But as I examined that, it was well organized. It was pretty. It was shiny. It was not doing anything. It was not servicing anything. It was not going anywhere. It was not accomplishing anything. You say, well, it's accomplishing its purpose. No, unless someone have told me, I wouldn't know it was an advertisement. What I'm telling you was, it was, it was all shiny, polished, silver, well-oiled, organized, but it was doing nothing and accomplishing nothing. We could have written an epitaph over the top of it, local churches. Well-oiled. We've got the greeters there. We've got the people coming in. We've got the programs. We want, come one, come all. I mean, sometimes I feel like really we ought to do it right. We ought to get out in front and uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, come watch the well-organized circus. Billy Graham, now known as Franklin Graham's father, said years ago that 97%, this was his belief, that in many churches in America, local assemblies in America, that in 97% of the churches, the Holy Spirit of God could be totally absent on Sunday morning and everything would go right on 
without missing a beat. Please, please understand. All is vain that we do unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. It's important that you feel welcome on Sunday morning. It's important that you feel welcome on Sunday night. It's important that you feel welcome when we gather together. It's important that you feel comfortable. It's important that your needs are met. But oh, dear God in heaven, what we need is to make God feel welcome. Because unless the Spirit of God meets with us, nothing is going to be accomplished for eternity. Lives will not be changed. The music may be heavenly. The preacher may preach a great sermon. But unless it has the fire of Almighty God upon it, it will not purge away sin. Unless it has the anointing of God, it will not convict people of sin. And unless we deal with the sin in our lives and our churches, there will never be revival in America. He said, you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Now listen, folks. Our churches are filled. Our churches are filled in the evangelical world. I'm not talking about Orthodox churches. I'm talking about evangelical churches. Our churches are filled with people who are there because they're supposed to be. And they are many who are coming to our churches every Sunday morning. I personally believe that the greatest readily available mission field in America is on the rolls of our churches. People are lost without God. They've made some kind of decision when they were a child that did not affect their lives whatsoever and they are lost. They do not know God. They do not love God. And the Bible says to those who believe Jesus is precious. And if Jesus is not precious to the people who sit in the pews, they're unsaved. To those who believe, He is precious. Does that mean that you could not stray? Of course we all stray. But even when we stray, Jesus is still precious. And we know what we need to do. We may not be doing it. Our hearts may grow hard, but Jesus is still precious. You say, no, Jesus is not precious to me. Then you are lost. I don't love God. Then you're lost. I don't serve God, then you're lost. You're wandering around in your own swamp of sin. No, God changes our nature. And we may go astray. And as the old hymn writer said, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love, but the child of God will come back. Why? Because we'll learn in Revelation chapter 3, the very last verses, Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The book of Hebrews corroborates everything that the rest of the Bible says. He that is without discipline is a bastard, an illegitimate child. He doesn't belong to God. Because God, listen, listen, listen. The Bible says every child that God receives, Hebrews chapter 12, every child. How many? Every child. All child. Children, each child of God. Every child of God he receives, receives discipline. You say, well, I I don't have any discipline in my life. Sure sign you're not saved. Why are we messing with this? We've got churches that are dead. Dead. Why? Because the Spirit of God does not live in the hearts of the people. Where the Spirit of God is, there is life. Or what Jesus says, not true. The Gospel of John says on that last day, the great day of Sukkot, 
of tabernacles on the great feast. The, the water pitcher ritual had been taken from the pool of Siloam, walking up that road that they found now in Jerusalem. I've walked on it. I pray one day you will. We can walk together from the pool of Siloam just like they did during the days of Jesus. Seven days a week they would go get that golden pitcher and fill it up and they would come beside the altar and in that ritual they would pour it out as a libation offering. Jesus watched that for seven days. He saw the beautiful ritual, the great uh, escapade that was before everyone's eyes to see. And he watched it, but there was no life. The people were doing routinely what they should do. He took it for seven days. And on the eighth day, something is said about Jesus that is rarely said. The Bible says, with a loud voice he cried out and said, If you are thirsty, if any man is thirsty, let him come and drink from me. And the water that I give him will be inside of him, a well of living water, and it will it will." flow out of his belly and become a river. Don't tell me, well, it's just not my personality to have life. When the Spirit of God comes within your life, He'll give you life. You can't help it. So let's quit excusing our lifeless worship and begin to worship the true and the living God. Why? Because he gives us life, not death. That's the devil, the enemy of our souls that brings death. Jesus has come to give us life. Life overflowing. Life abundantly. You can have it in Jesus. Amen. Father in heaven, take these words and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. We hope that the Spirit of God has touched you through Tony's message and that your knowledge of the Bible continues to grow. As you study the truth of the Bible and you feel you do not fully understand what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we would like to help you. Contact us today at TonyCrisp.org and we will send you this free booklet. How to Know God in a Personal Way. This resource will help answer your questions about how you can begin your journey as a follower of Jesus. Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp is made possible because of your prayers and generous financial support. If you feel God is leading you to contribute to this ministry, you can easily give online at tonycrisp.org donate. Or you can send your gift to P.O. Box 6596, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37914. A gift in any amount is appreciated. No gift is too small, and there's no gift too large that can be used to God's highest purpose. Thank you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hi, I'm Tony Crisp, and for 40 years I've been walking the land of Israel, bringing hundreds of pastors, hundreds of leaders from across America to walk this land with me. I want you to come and experience this yourself and allow the words of this book to jump off of the page and into your heart and change your life. The reason I'm here is because of the ruins of the ancient city behind me. This is the ancient city of Hippus. It's one of the 10 cities of the Decapolis. It is the city I believe that Jesus referred to when he talked about a city that was set on a hill that could not be hidden. The people from Capernaum would look this way every night 
and see it aglow with the Roman torches and with the Roman lamps. And Jesus said that that's the way our lives are with the light of the glory of God within us. Go to our website today, tlcholylandtours.com and find out how you can book the experience of a lifetime and God will change your life in this land. As Christians grow in knowledge about the Bible, we often try to visualize its history. Most of us wonder what it would be like to be in the places mentioned in the scriptures. That dream is made a reality for hundreds of people each year through TLC Holy Land Tours. For more than 40 years, Dr. Tony Crisp has led thousands of church leaders and pastors on life-changing spiritual journeys to the land where the history of the Bible comes alive. Join Tony on a trip to the Holy Land. You will be in awe as you visit places where the prophets of the Old Testament carried out God's commands. Experience the reverence as you stand on the ground where Jesus stood, sail on the waters where He walked, and hear teaching in places where our Lord spoke. Your experience in the Holy Land will add a new dimension to your understanding of the Scriptures. You will never read the Bible the same way again. You can start your journey today and explore your touring options at tlcholylandtours.com. That's tlcholylandtours.com. I want to invite you to join me each weekday for the podcast On the Way with Dr. Tony Crisp. Monday through Thursday, we explore biblical passages, people, places, and prophecies. Each Friday, I answer questions from listeners. If you have a biblical question you would like answered, please email us today at questions at tonycrisp.org. That's questions at tonycrisp.org. You can find these podcasts on every major platform. These podcasts are 7 to 15 minutes long and will help you to get your day started right and will encourage you and your family as you walk with God and enjoy your journey. Israel, it is the heart of the Middle East, the most important country in all of human history. The connection between this land and your heart is undeniable, but you can also be a blessing to this nation by partnering with the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. So get involved and be a blessing to the nation and the people of Israel. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. Your embassy, your voice. Join us today.